Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you virtually and actually for those of you joining us in the jewel box at the Tanner Humanities Center to this in our series of work in progress talks. This morning, we or this afternoon, we are joined by Professor Cynthia Stark. She received her PhD in philosophy from the University of North Carolina, and she holds a master's degree in political science specializing in political theory from the University of Pittsburgh. Her works are wide ranging. They touch on the areas of political, moral, and feminist philosophy. Her articles have been published widely, including in the Journal of Philosophy and the Journal of Political Philosophy, among many others. Um, she has been with us this year as a Tanner Humanities Fellow, and she's interrogating issues and questions of blame. Um, the paper that she workshopped for us last week um, is provocative, is problematizing the notion of um, who it is we blame, who it is that gets to enjoy innocence, and really how we form our thoughts about that. So um, without any further delay, um, I'm not seeing the room where um, Professor Stark is, but I imagine that'll be coming online soon. There she is, <laughs> wonderful. So please join me in welcoming Professor Stark to present. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, you're gonna have to bear with me with the technology. Okay, share screen, right? Mm -hmm. It works. Okay, can the Zoom people see the? Yes, we've got it, thank you. Okay, great. Oh, wow, that was a lot easier than I thought. <laughs> Okay, um, well, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, I really appreciate your joining me today. Um, I wanna thank Erica, of course, Jeremy, uh, Katie, who's always saves the day with the technology, <laughs> <laughs> Susan, um, for their support of, of us, the fellows and the center. And I, I also wanna thank uh, my fellow fellows. Um, it's just been a really enriching and fun, uh, semester sharing work with one another. It's just, it's been just really, really um, a great experience. So thanks, thanks to my fellows also. Um, okay, so today I'm using PowerPoint for the first time, so don't judge. Um, today I'm gonna to be talking about blaming norms and the practice of victim blaming. Um, can I hide? Can I hide my self view? We actually don't see it, so it's presenting well for the recording. For what that's worth, I don't know if the people in the Zoom room, in the actual room, see it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So my thesis is that the practice of blaming women rape victims is structured by norms that are perversions of certain defensible norms that govern uh, our general practices of blaming. And in some cases, these distorted blaming norms are combined with distorted retributivist norms of punishment. Um, the thought behind this approach is that the presence of these familiar but nevertheless warped or somehow distorted um, norms within victim blaming ideologies can help explain why the ideologies are appealing to us, why they seem legitimate or reasonable, um, even though what they do is provide warrant for blaming persons who are not blameworthy. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do today. First, I'm gonna give some background, which is just to talk about the general project of which this presentation is a part. Um, then I'm gonna say some, uh, some things about blame, just give you some of the basics, things that I draw on in my analysis of victim blaming. A very brief outline of retributivist use of punishment, which I also draw on in my analysis. And then I'm just gonna talk about uh, two types of uh, rape victim blaming, what I call uh, provocation cases and retribution cases. All right, so this paper is, as I said, part of a larger project on misplaced blame. The practices that I um, discuss in this project are victim blaming, gaslighting, scapegoating, tone policing, and what I call blame immunizing. 
Uh, the first four of these assign uh, blame to people who don't deserve it. And the last one withholds blame from people who do deserve it. So an example of blame immunizing that was recently um, in the news was when a Georgia law enforcement official described a mass shooter as having a bad day. I don't know if some of you remember that. Um, okay, so now, um, let me, I'm just gonna assume that people know what victim blaming is and that they know what scapegoating is. But I wanna say something about gaslighting and tone policing because I think people aren't uh, quite as familiar with these ideas. Um, one way to characterize gaslighting, it's not the only way, but the way I defend, is um, as casting doubt on the credibility of someone's um, judgment or their perception by claiming that it's not credible because it comes from a defect in that person. And um, for those of you who are familiar with the film Gaslight, I'm looking for nods. People, have people seen, seen the film? Okay, not that many people have. But for those of you who have seen the film from which the, you know, the term comes, Gregory uh, denies the credibility of um, Paula's perception that the gas lights are dimming. Um, by, by claiming that it's not credible because it comes from her deluded mind, right? So the, the credibility of perception is, is called into question because it was generated in the wrong way from some defect, some defect in her. Now, how is this related to misplaced blame? Well, the fact of the matter is, is that gaslighting is often a response to a warranted judgment of blame. And when it is, it's a case of a blameworthy person trying to pin blame on the blamer. Okay, so I'll give you an example in a second. But first, let me say what tone policing is. Okay, tone policing is when a person who complains of injustice is blamed for her manner of expressing her complaint while the blameworthiness of the perpetrator, the person she's complaining about, is sidelined. So imagine a boss telling an employee who angrily complains of a coworker's sexual harassment uh, that her tone is unprofessional. That's an example of tone policing. Okay, so here's an example that I, that I love. Um, it's from uh, a book by Robin, uh, Robin Stern called The Gaslight Effect. And I'm using it because it combines tone, uh, gaslighting and tone policing in one fell swoop. Okay, when Mitchell wears some new clothes to Sunday dinner at his parents' home, his mother bursts out laughing. Oh, Mitchell, that outfit is all wrong for you. You look ridiculous, she says. Please, dear, the next time you go shopping, let me help you. When Mitchell feels hurt and asks his mother to apologize, right, essentially blaming her uh, for her remarks, she shakes her head sadly. I was only trying to help, she says, and I'd like an apology from you for that tone of voice. <laughs> Okay, so what's going on here is that Mitchell's blaming his mother for her condescending behavior. She gaslights him by claiming that he's requesting an apology, not because she owes him one, right? But because she gravely misunderstands his motives. She cannot see that he, that she has his best interests in mind, that she's only trying to help. And then she turns the table on him and demands that he apologize for an allegedly disrespectful way of demanding the apology. And that is the case of, um, and that's when she tone polices him. Okay, so that's all I'm gonna say about the other kinds of um, practice of misplaced blame that I'm gonna be thinking about um, or, uh, and writing about. Um, but so let me now just focus on, on, on victim blaming and I'm gonna, I'm gonna lead, um, with an example. Okay, so this is something that a fan of Bill Cosby said in response to his indictment for aggravated indecent assault uh, for drugging a woman and sexually assaulting her. Uh, the issue is determining what constitutes rape. I don't think that making a series of questionable decisions leading to you having an intoxicated relation with someone and later regretting it or feeling like you were assaulted constitutes as rape. I think a lot of people 
both men and women would be able to lock partners up if this was a valid basis to charge someone with sexual assault. Okay, so um, I think this kind of thinking is fairly familiar. I think it's fairly common. Um, and this is the kind of thinking that I wanna, I wanna focus on today. Uh, let me start by just saying some stuff about theories of blame. Okay, so these are two unifying features of contemporary accounts of blame. So whatever differences various theories of blame have, they, they do have consensus about these two features um, that are due to P.F. Strassen. And, and I'm gonna explain these and then, and then say how they're relevant to my, my analysis of victim blame. The first is what McGreer calls the metaphysical non-commitment non-commitment thesis. And this says that the dispute about free will and determinism is irrelevant to the coherence of our responsibility practices, including blaming. So the idea is that the norms and concepts that we use in our responsibility practices do not presuppose a libertarian notion of freedom of the will, as some have argued, right? So the truth or falsity of determinism is irrelevant to ascriptions of moral responsibility. Um, those ascriptions um, are uh, reasonably founded not on the metaphysical property, right, freedom of the will, but rather just on the capacity of individuals to participate in responsibility practices. Okay. The second feature of contemporary views of blame is what I'm calling the forensic method. And this says that certain features of our responsibility practices, in particular what Strassen calls the reactive attitudes, are treated as embedded in our natures as social beings with a capacity for morality. Reactive attitudes are emotions such as resentment, indignation, guilt, and remorse. They're called reactive because of the feelings we tend to have in response to others' regard for us, which we care about just as a matter, that's just a matter of our psychology, right? So Strassen just takes that as a, a, a psychological fact about us that we care about how people regard and treat us. So according to Strassen, we can gain an understanding of the nature of moral responsibility by examining our feelings and our practices of blaming and holding responsible and how these practices um, work to sustain moral community, okay? Now, my argument about victim blaming depends on these Strassonian assumptions in the following ways. First, I assume that we can do an analysis of victim blaming without settling the dispute about freedom of the will, right? Um, but, but just instead by evaluating the, the, the actual practices. Secondly, um, in arguing that the norms of victim blaming are distortions of unobjectable, unobjectionable or defensible blaming norms, um, I look to philosophical theories of blame and to isolate those norms. And this I'm claiming is just and not to an empirical literature. So I'm claiming that this is justified because of the Strassonian forensic method that um, philosophical theories of blame deploy, right? So because these theories, these articulations or defenses of blaming practices um, consist primarily in just analyses or distillations of actual practices, they turn out to be a useful place to go if you want to study the norms of um, blaming and holding responsible. Okay, now, um, here's an important distinction that theorists of blame make. They distinguish between being responsible and holding responsible. To be responsible, individuals must have certain capacities or powers, for example, the, um, the ability to respond to reasons, to understand the demands of morality, to act on moral motives, and so forth. To hold people responsible is to respond to them in ways that are made appropriate by the judgment that they are morally responsible beings, uh, typically by subjecting them to praise and blame, okay? Now, individuals who lack the capacities necessary for morally responsible agency are, are exempted from blame. Um, examples, very young children, people with dementia, right? Toddlers are exempted from blame. If they have a meltdown, someone with dementia would be exempted from blame if uh, 
she say broke a promise, okay? Those are exemptions. So exemptions um, apply when people don't have the relevant capacities. Now, people who do have the capacities, morally responsible beings, are nevertheless sometimes excused from blame, okay? And this is due to circumstances surrounding their actions. Um, and they're excused when they fail to meet one of two conditions, one or both of these conditions, okay? The first is the control condition. Um, according to the control condition, a person um, is, um, who is blameworthy, who engages in a behavior, um, uh, the person to be blameworthy must be the agent of their action or the author of their action, okay, in order to be blameworthy. So for example, a bank teller who hands over the bank's money at gunpoint doesn't meet the control condition. Um, a robber who's robbing the bank because he's been hypnotized <laughs> doesn't meet the control condition, okay? Um, those are obvious examples. I mean, blame theorists argue about what these, the very, the exact contours of this condition are. But those are obvious cases. The second condition is called the epistemic condition, and that says that a person um, to be blameworthy must have knowledge of important facts uh, relevant to her act. So for example, if um, a, a person, if a person misses, misses your 50th birthday party because someone gave them the wrong address, right, then they, uh, they're excused from blame um, because they didn't have the relevant knowledge. Okay, so for blame to be warranted, uh, mor uh, morally responsible beings must meet both the uh, control condition and the epistemic condition, and it must be the case that their act was in some way morally objectionable, right, because we level blame at people for wrongdoing, right? And finally, the person blaming them must have standing to blame. And I'll say something about that in a minute. My analysis of victim blaming does not take a stand on debates about the criteria for morally responsible agency or what is necessary exactly to meet the control or epistemic conditions. Um, and also uh, my view assumes that third party and imp impersonal blame are justified. So according to that view, uh, members of the moral community have standing to blame wrongdoers all things equal, um, even if they're not the victim, and even if the wrongdoer is a stranger, okay? Um, so this captures the intuition that maybe many of us share that all of us here who are morally responsible agents um, have standing to blame, for example, Vladimir Putin for invading Ukraine, okay? We're not the victims of the wrong. We, we, we're not personally acquainted with, with Putin. Nevertheless, we have a standing to blame. And the reason I stress this is because a lot of people who blame victims, a lot of victim blaming is third party and impersonal. Like, like for example, the Cosby example, right? Like that person did not know the wrongdoer who he thinks in this case is the woman, right? And he's not the victim, right? But he's leveling blame. So, um, I wanna be clear that my view is not that what's objectionable about victim blaming is that it's third party or impersonal because I actually think that that kind of blame is, um, is justified. Again, all things equal, there could be exceptions. Okay, so very quickly, let me say something about retributive theories of punishment. There are three tenets. Uh, the first is those who commit serious crimes morally deserve to suffer a proportionate punishment. The second is that the punishment must be imposed by a person or an institution that has the moral standing to punish, typically the state. And it is morally impermissible to punish innocent people intentionally or to give wrongdoers punishments that are disproportionately large. All right, so I'll, I'll be um, drawing on those um, ideas as you'll see. All right, I'm first gonna talk about what I'm calling provocation victim blaming. Um, the first, um, oh, sorry. So, well, okay, first there's two types, provocation and, retrib and retribution victim blame. So in provocation cases, sorry, the victim is seen as culpable for being raped. And in retribution cases, the victim is seen as deserving to be raped. So that's how these are distinguished. Um, provocation victim blaming is, is captured in slogans like she brought it on herself or she was asking for it. Uh, retribution victim blaming is captured in comments like she had it coming to her or she needed to be taught a lesson. Okay, so um, <clears throat> let me move on now just to, um, to provocation cases. All right, 
So um, the first step to understand understanding the logic of victim blaming is, in cases of rape, but probably in general, is to figure out how the actions of the of the parties involved uh, must be interpreted in order for the victim for victim blaming to be intelligible in the first place. Okay, what assumptions about the motives, intentions, the past of the parties um, have to be in play, right, in order for victim blaming to make sense? I think there are two general assumptions. One is uh, the woman did something. She did something that contributed um, to or brought about her victimization. She had to have done something. And the thing she did um, had to be morally objectionable because she can't be culpable or deserving of retribution um, unless she did a wrongful or otherwise morally problematic thing. Okay. So I want you to imagine a situation where a man and a woman are um, say in a bar and they're uh, expressing their mutual sexual attraction. They're standing close together. Maybe they're touching one another. Maybe they're whispering in one another's ears and so on and so forth. Um, and then eventually uh, later the, uh, the man subsequently rapes the woman. Okay, so that's, I'm trying to describe that in neutral terms. There's just these two people, they're engaging in this kind of conduct. All right. These are interpretations um, of that situation that can make sense of provocation judgments. Now, I, I need to be clear that I am not proposing these as accurate <laughs> descriptions of what's going on there. I'm proposing them as interpretations of what's going on that can make sense then of attributions of, of blame toward the, 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 the woman. Um, they're obviously sexist. I think that we should treat them as myths or scripts that are circulating within the culture that are in fact part of uh, the practice of victim blaming. Okay, so they are uh, temptation and clueless. Uh, in temptation, the woman is intentionally acting in ways she knows are arousing to the man. She knows that his arousal will make him want to have sex with her, and she does not intend to have sex with him. She's simply having too much fun to slow things down. In Clueless, the woman does not realize the extent to which her behavior is arousing the man, uh, or she doesn't know that this arousal will make him want to have sex with her, and she does not intend to have sex with him. She just thinks they're flirting or having fun. Okay, now, on these interpretations, what is the woman's act? Her act is failing in her obligation to refrain from overly arousing the man, okay? As described, this act is wrong. It's a failure to fulfill an obligation. Uh, and further, the woman meets the control and epistemic conditions, we can assume. She could have decided not to do this, right? And um, she knows what she's doing. So she's blameworthy for her act. You might think that the woman in Clueless does not meet the epistemic condition, um, but, I think that from a, a victim blaming kind of mindset, uh, women like the woman in Clueless are likely to be seen as in fact meeting the epistemic condition on the ground that they should have known how their behavior would affect the man, right? So someone, someone like the woman in Clueless is gonna be seen as culpably ignorant. Okay, what's the man's act? It's the act of rape. So uh, my proposal is that it's sensible uh, for the victim to be blamed, not just for her alleged wrong of arousing the man, right, but also for the rape. If we view the man as exempted, exempted from blame on the ground that he fails to meet a criterion for morally responsible agency. If we think of him as in the grips of genuinely irresistible urges. He's exempted rather than excused on this way of thinking um, because his inability to control himself is not a matter of the particular circumstances, but rather it's seen as rooted in his nature as a man, as a presumably straight man, okay? So on this way of thinking, provocation victim believing reasoning goes like this. The woman is culpable for the man's act of rape because she caused it by failing in her duty to modulate his sexual responses. The distorted blaming norm at work here is an exemption criterion stating that men are not capable of sexual self-regulation. Notice that this norm not only exempts uh, the man from blame for raping the woman, it is also explains the obligation she has in the first place to uh, control his sexual arousal. Okay, so it's doing double duty in this way of thinking. All right, 
So that's the provocation case. That's my proposed interpretation of provocation victim blaming reasoning. Let me move on to, um, to retribution cases. Okay, so um, these are possible interpretations of the bar scenario that I asked you to imagine uh, that can make sense of retribution judgments. Uh, again, these are not, I am not proposing these as accurate interpretations by any means. Okay, so tease. The woman is knowingly intentionally arousing the man and she knows that he interprets her conduct as telegraphing an intention to have sex with him. And she has no intention to have sex with him uh, should he initiate it, which she expects him to do. Her aim is essentially to excite him and then refuse to satisfy him. Okay, naivete. Again, this is gonna be similar to clueless. The woman is knowingly and intentionally arousing the man with no intention of having sex, but she does not know that he interprets her conduct as conveying the intention to have sex with him, um, nor does she necessarily expect him to initiate it. Uh, she's just getting a charge out of, uh, out of exciting him. Okay, so what is the woman's act in this, according to this interpretation of the bar scenario? Well, her act is deceiving the man into thinking she intends to have sex with him. She's leading him on, as people say, right? Uh, the act as described is wrong. It's an act of deception. And the woman meets the control and epistemic conditions. And so she's blameworthy. And I'm assuming again, that the woman in naivete is um, culpably ignorant. So she should have known that she was, what kind of message she was sending when she was engaged in this sexually charged um, uh, activity with the man. Okay. Now, this is where things get a little bit um, complicated. So the man's act is the act of rape. Now we might think that the perpetrator here is not blameworthy according to retribution, victim blaming thinking, right? Uh, because his action isn't wrong. It's a justified act of retribution for the wrong that the woman committed, namely the wrong of deception. Okay, now I don't think that's right. Um, and there are two sets of problems, I think, with uh, interpreting retribution victim blaming in this way. The first set of problems has to do with the internal logic of the reasoning. First of all, deception is not a crime, right? So it's not punishable. Secondly, even if it were, the victim does not have standing to punish. And even if he did have standing to punish, the punishment is disproportionate to the crime, okay? Um, it's, it's, he, he, the punishment is rape, the crime is deception, right? Okay, so this in a sense violates these retributive norms about punishment, okay? The second problem is that the, this retribution narrative, um, the first pass, is directly in conflict with the provocation narrative. Because on this narrative, the rapist chooses to rape the woman as an act of punishment. Okay, and so he does, in fact, meet the criteria for a responsible agency, which he didn't meet in the provocation case. But in all the interpretations I gave you, there was no difference in the woman's actions, right? There were only differences in the woman's intentions or motives. So, um, but the intentions and motives of the woman, when she's engaging in whatever kind of sexualized behavior she's perceived to be engaging in, has no bearing on the man's ability to control himself, right? So the question is, why is the man thought to be unable to control himself when the woman is tempting or provoking him, but then thought to be able to control himself when she's thought to be deceiving him, right? Um, now there's plenty of incompatible ideologies that <laughs> float around and live together. So this isn't definitive against this interpretation, but I'm gonna propose a, an interpretation that I think um, makes the provocation and retribution narratives um, compatible. All right, so let me start with uh, an analogy. I put that in quotes because it's really a dis disanalogy. Um, okay, imagine this situation. A agrees to give B $100 with no intention of doing so and does not turn over the money. When B realizes that A has no intention, intention of following through, B takes $100 from A's wallet. Okay, now, if the man's act of rape is interpreted along these lines, then the disproportionality problem is averted, right? 
the thought is that the woman basically agreed to have sex with the man when she was um, engaged in sexually charged activity with him. When she refused him, uh, she broke her agreement. And when the man raped her, he merely took from her what she had agreed to give him, okay? Now, um, on this disanalogy, we avert the, the proportionality problem, but the punishability and standing problems remain, okay? However proportionate B's response is to A's uh, refusal to give the money, it's still clear that what B did was a wrongful act. It's an act of theft and not a justified punishment because A's, a, because A's deception, as this is described, is not a crime. And even if it were, say A had signed a legal contract, um, B doesn't have standing to punish A for violating it. So here's my proposal. My proposal is we can come up with a, um, a better reconstruction of retributive retribution victim blaming by combining the provocation victim blaming narrative with the proportionality reasoning contained in this um, disanalogy. Okay, so this is my idea. Uh, this, is this is how we should think about retribution victim blaming reasoning. The rapist is exempted from blame on the ground that he cannot control his sexual urges. Nevertheless, the woman got what she deserved when the man raped her. Her deception was akin to a crime in its seriousness and so eligible for punishment in the cosmic sense. And the agent of the punishment was not the rapist, but rather, for lack of a better term, the universe, right? So her rape on this retribution thinking was an act of poetic justice. The distorted norms involved then are, again, the exemption criterion saying that men are not capable of sexual self-regulation. And then um, a distorted retributive norm which takes rape to be a proportionate response to sexual deception by treating it as akin to taking what was falsely promised to one, right? So I think that's the best way um, to understand the retribution, the retribution discourse, that particular narrative. Okay, and that is the end of my talk. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Okay. All right. Now I have to do technological things. Um. <clears throat> okay. As is our custom, those of us in the Zoom room, um, thank you. Well, we're all thanking you. Um, we'll um, watch and have access to answering or asking questions of our speaker. And then, um, Cynthia, I'm going to invite you to view your regular room and field questions there as well. So, okay. um, See, oh, there's a thing in the chat, sorry. Um, I will relay the chat from your colleague, Professor Leslie Francis um, of Philosophy and Law, who is going to have, oh, she might not even be here anymore. Oh, there she is. Um, she says that she would like to hear more about why if the victim is blamed, the racist, rapist, sorry, rapist um, can't be blamed too in the first type of victim blaming provocation. Does that make, does that? Yeah, matter? I'm just looking at it. Um, yeah, okay, good, great question, Leslie. Um, you're right, I think he can also be blamed. Okay, it seemed to me. I have no idea how I did that. Oh, I know, I was trying to get rid of the chat. Um, okay, so. One point is though. Leslie has a follow-up or? Okay, go ahead, Leslie. Yeah, I mean, what I was saying, it looked to me as though at one point you were assuming that he couldn't be because of the form that his sexual urges. Were. Yeah. Okay, so I think in the provocation cases, he is exempted. But I don't think that's the case with all types of victim blaming. Um, so there's a shifting, so victim blaming involves shifting blame, but I don't think, I mean, the question is, is there a fixed amount? And then, you know, it has to be moved that fixed amount or whether it can be shared. I mean, there's lots of interesting questions around that. There's, let me just very quickly say, I, there's other types of victim blaming where I think that the, vic, the rapist is not exempted. Um, so one, um, so three other types of, of uh, victim blaming directed toward rape victims are flaunting cases, um, uh, 
what, what do I call the other one? Oh, bad judgment cases and regret cases. And I think in those cases, he is, the rapist is not uh, absolved completely. He may be partially exonerated, but he's, but he's not absolved. And the, and the victim is seen as having contributed to the victimization, but not has having been the full cause of it. Um, right, so um, yeah, but I do think in provocation cases, he's exempted. Or let's, can I can I call on someone here, Erica? Yeah, and if you invite them to come up, or if they project, or if they Thank if you repeat the question, I think it's easiest if they come up. Do you want to come up here? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. It's it's just much better for the recording. Yeah. So this is interesting, uh, and I like your analysis of the two cases. And you're very clear that you're not trying to give like a comprehensive account of every different kind of, of victim blaming, even in cases of sexual violence. But I want to present a subset of cases of said victim blaming that I think put pressure on the limits of a sort of broadly Strassonian approach here. Oh. Okay. So uh, the, 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 you know there there are well attested cases of victim blaming in cases of sexual violence where it's not about anything that the victim does, but just who they are, right? So in cases of say ethnic war, rapes in those cases are, this other group deserves to be raped just because she's, she's a member of this other group or, uh, or trans and queer people. Right. Sometimes you, you hear just in virtue of being a deviant, this person deserves to be raped. Uh, and certain racial stereotypes, stereotypes of sensuality or submissiveness and so on are sometimes invoked in cases of victim blaming and rape that this person deserves to be raped because they're just essentially this kind of person, right? And, and, and in all of these cases, it's not act focused, right? And, and so it seems like, I, I'm not saying that, that the structuring group doesn't work for these cases, but I, I do wanna hear if you think that there that there's are just gonna be a limit where you have to start putting in another framework in practice to make sense of all sorts of victim blaming. Okay, wait, can I just ask a question? Yeah. What what about the Strassonian account is places the limits? Uh, so that it has to be the, the, the reactive attitudes toward an action. The, 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 what, the reactive attitudes towards an action that involve uh judgments of uh <laughs> Uh, of someone's abilities as a moral agent, like well, well, because it's obviously like I am not in control of what my race yeah. is, so, right? And okay. so that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna have to think about that. Um, one thing I want to say is, uh, like, with respect to some some people who are targeted because of who they are, is that um, the idea of, is that they need to be punished for their deviance. I agree with that. I think I'm trying to, so what I'm trying to think is, does that, can we capture that within a kind of Strassonian perspective or not? Um, and I have to think about it. Um, another kind of case, see, I think this is kind of what's going on in scapegoating and I could be, I could be wrong, is that you, right, so you have a certain trait and, and, and you're blamed for having this trait. But it's also obviously something for which it would be unreasonable to hold you responsible, as you pointed out, right? So my thought was in those kinds of cases, um, there is a distorted blaming norm. And it's basically a norm that says that you can be held responsible for a trait that's beyond your control. So that would still fit generally within, I think, this picture of, look, these, there's some blaming norm that's gone wrong here. Right. And so then, you know, so the question is, why is someone who is, for example, Jewish, right, um, blamed for this trait that's considered part of an immutable essence that they have, right? Because that would seem immediately as something that they couldn't be, be blamed for. But that's a really useful question. Thank you. I do want to think about that. Okay. I don't see any here. So we'll kick it back there. Does anyone have any questions from here? Well, you could repeat this one. Be, sure, be I will. Yes, I'd be happy to. This is a protest about linguistic matters. So okay. the term rapist gets used throughout these conversations. Okay. Connotations that seem 
inappropriate if we're looking at specific cases, but that might be a single action and not the pattern of action that the term rapist suggests. So how about switching to the term rape or instead of- Oh, interesting. I see. So Peggy's, Peggy's question is, she has some worries about the term rapist because she think it suggests that someone who's like serial, a serial rapist or, or, or has some sort of disposition to rape generally. And it's a part of this character. Yeah, this yeah. And so she was suggesting that we use a term more like raper if we're going to be um, referring to uh, like a particular act. I don't know what to say about that because typically, I mean, it's sort of a linguistic convention to refer to the person who committed the rape as a rapist. I know. It's, and it's no, you think it's a bad linguistic convention. Yeah. Mm. So, and of course, when we're talking about these, you know, sort of illustrative example cases, right? We're just talking about one case at a time. Yeah. And it's not going to be a count whether that's either it's a serial week thing. Or next week or next week after that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, mm. you know, you see it in cases like the discussion of Kavanaugh's um, high school behavior. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I don't know that I have a really strong view about this, but I might want to push back against it a little bit because I think what my worry is the opposite problem um, where someone like Kavanaugh or someone like Brock Turner, you know, who was, who was the, the Stanford swimmer, not only in sentence for sexual assault, um, you know, whether there's a kind of uh, blame immunizing going on when we don't use that label to describe them, right? I mean, right. someone who rapes someone is a rapist because they've committed rape, right? Well, and is he a rapist? That is, is that the way he would be yeah. yeah, that's the yeah. distinction. That I'm I mean, it's interesting. I hadn't thought about it. Mm -hmm. I hadn't thought about it. Making these conversations around each other. Yeah. And of course, that comes with all its own problems about giving somebody character label that is much broader than you might But I don't know, I'm sorry, I don't want to go on about this, but if I say you're a violinist, like, I don't know, it just means you play the violin, right? Does it, I guess, yeah, but, you do, it, but you do it all the time as part of who you are. Yeah, and you've been practicing it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. God. <laughs> okay, um, so, so if, if that exchange is concluded, we have it's a done. question from the Z Zoom room, Chernell who is joining us as one of our graduate student fellows from the Department of Communications. I sure know. Yeah, thank you so much for this talk. And um, yeah, I really enjoyed your paper and really enjoyed this presentation. And so I'm wondering if maybe you could talk about um, misplaced blame and um, how this talk fits with the other chapters that you're doing in this project. And um, do you kind of look at other case studies and, and how does this, work on um, victim blaming and um, rape and sexual assault relate to the other types of misplaced blame that you talk about in the in the larger book? Well, I mean, most of what I've already completed is stuff on gaslighting. I've just embarked on the stuff on victim blaming. And so I, I really don't have anything really useful to say about it. My hope is that it's gonna turn out that in, in victim blaming generally say not just the blaming of rape victims, but the blaming of, say, victims of police brutality um, or victims of poverty and so on, that, that the general framework will hold, which is that there's some way in which familiar and otherwise unobjectionable blaming norms are distorted enough that, um, you know, it makes sense that, that the victim blaming norm has some, some pull on us. Um, but, I, but I haven't figured out exactly what they are for the other kinds of cases, because uh, I've only been thinking about, about the rape cases. Okay. Did you have a question, Eric? I did. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're back to the room. Yeah. 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 So, Sorry. Um, so, so I wanted to offer maybe a little bit of a uh, uh, pushback against something you were doing at the very end and also raise a question about it. Um, so, because uh, I, I think I, I, I like your sort of final analysis in terms of the idea that it's the, uh, retribution from the universe, 
Um, and, and part of what that calls to my mind are certain religious conceptions. Um, and that, that then in turn makes me question whether the um, part about the framing that the offense in terms of something like promising or, you know, oh, uh, or agreement is really um, necessary here, um, right? Because uh, instead of interpreting the um, wrongdoing on the part of the, um, you know, on the part of the victim here, uh, in terms of the, the promising, there are other conceptions available of what, what the wrong uh, done was, right? And so, you know, on a, on a very kind of traditional view, the mere engendering of certain thoughts or desires in other people is itself a sin, regardless of whether or not it's a promise, right? Um, and so that makes me wonder whether that's really, whether that, that aspect really needs to be in there. Obviously, it, it could be in many cases, but whether you want to pin your analysis really to that. Um, and then that uh, brings to mind a, another issue that may be connected to it, which uh, maybe you've thought about this, um, which would be in those cases where those kinds of considerations get especially muddy, um, you know, how that would affect the analysis and, and the particular case I have in mind. So, so the bar case, right, would be subject to this other, uh, this kind of religious view in which, well, in provoking the, you know, I'm just, I think adopt your scenario here, right? In provoking the man, the, you know, the woman is committing a sin, yes. right? Okay. But part of the background to that is precisely because they're unmarried, for example, um, <laughs> and, the, and the, you know, the, the lust, you know, for this other person is itself problematic. Right. And in a different context, that gets a lot messier, for example, in the context of marriage. Right. And then it becomes you know, why? Why has it been so hard to recognize something like spousal rape? Well, part of it is because um, that context makes those you know, uh, concerns about the, those improper desires much harder to sort out. That's a great question. And I, I think, um, I just want to think about it, but I, I think you're right that, that I can't just pin it on the, on the promising or you, you know, you said you were going to, and then you didn't do it right kind of case. Um, I wasn't thinking specifically um, religious terms and you might be right that that's, that's behind some of it. Um, one, um, so there's an, there's a massive empirical literature on the blaming of rape victims. And it, it's interesting to me in a lot of ways. And um, I mean, well, interesting. That <laughs> was sort of a euphemism. It's puzzling to me in a lot of ways because um, there's a tendency to take all different kinds of victim blaming, like what I'm distinguishing as provocation and retribution and flaunting and bad judgment and regrets and lying and all this stuff, and to put it under one umbrella and then to try to come up with a, a kind of general explanation for why these rape, these, um, victim blaming narratives are so appealing and widespread. And it just, it strikes me as very strange that someone would want to give this kind of unifying explanation when, as now you're pointing out, it's actually kind of subtle, right? I mean, even within one particular type of retribution, there might be different ideas floating around in the background that are making that reasoning seem reliable. But one of the, one of the explanations for um, victim blaming is uh, that's pretty popular is called the just world theory, right? Which is that um, the slogan is people deserve what they get and get what they deserve. And the idea is people have a psychological investment in thinking that, you know, people get what they deserve and they deserve what they get. And so the world is a just place and I don't have to be afraid. <laughs> um, and um, I think this really explains really well the retribution victim blaming um, sort of uh, case that I described. But I don't think it explains the regret cases. You know, I don't think it explains like bad judgment cases. Like, well, why were you fill in the blank walking alone at night or making, what did the Cosby fan say? A series of questionable decisions that led to you being in an intoxicated relation, right? So, so yeah, so I'm just kind of pointing out that you're making a really good point by by indicating how nuanced some of these kinds of explanations might be. And I was really quite frankly thinking in secular terms, but I think you may be right that there are religious ideals standing behind, standing behind them. Thank you. Jeremy. Is there, oh. <laughs> 
Okay, so thanks for that, Cindy. It's just, it is so thought provoking. Um, so I have, I have a kind of, I'm a dumb English person question. Um, <laughs> so one might say, hearing a talk like this, or one might respond to just the scenarios you're sort of letting out, like, of course, this is like a crazy logic. Yeah. You are the rapist. Yeah, sure. You are trying to pin the blame on the victim of, yeah. of this. You committed a violent crime against somebody, and now you're trying to rationalize right. this. Right. And, and I would say like, to, there's a certain kind of common sense response, which is like, of course, this is wrong. So the first kind of like broad general question is sort of what does this fine grained analysis sort of help us see or understand that we sort of didn't already or we didn't sort of, is it just that we sort of didn't know how to articulate what was wrong? And then a kind of second related question has to do with a sort of pragmatic or praxis into which this theory might feed, which is to say that we have a very obviously polarized divisive society uh, along gender lines, among many other things. And it would be to say that um, like certain kind of feminist leaning people would, would just, again, be fully committed to just the inherent wrongness of rape and, and the non-blameworthiness of the victims of rape. But the people who are perpetrating rape are equally committed to a sort of different set of moral norms, which would be something like, you might say I have no standing to inflict this retributive justice, mm -hmm. but nobody else is going to do it. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah, I have yeah, to yeah. do it. Yeah. So, so, so the first kind of question is like, what does this help us see and understand? But the second question is kind of, how would this help us negotiate a situation where we have two people who kind of accept totally different it's sets right. of, of norms around these behaviors? Okay. Okay, thank you. That was not a dumb English question. That was a smart, that was a smart philosophy question. Um, so, I okay. So, uh, uh, let me just take the first question first. So, that is actually a great question. So, what I um, like, you're right. And sometimes when I was writing this, I was just thinking, well, oh, this, this is just who would think this way? It's just not you know the, the logic just isn't correct, right? So, but my thought. But nevertheless, right, if this kind of victim blaming thinking is widespread, right? Mm -hmm. So this was, and, and I've become convinced, and I guess this is, and this doesn't come out in this paper because I haven't, I haven't done this part of my project yet. I've, been, I've become convinced that a very large part of um, uh, the cause, let's say, or the structure of systemic and structural injustice has to do with unfairly distributing blame. Um, and I, I didn't used to think that in the past. Like I just thought about various ways people are marginalized and oppressed and various things that people say and do about them and double binds and all kinds of things. And then it occurred to me that this is, that these practices are super important to explaining. So part of it's an explanatory thing. Like I wanna be able to explain structural and systemic injustice by pointing to these practices of misplaced blame. And, um, but that's not a completely an answer to your question. So the, but, but the thought was um, we could also, and I, I kind of alluded to this at the beginning, um, if we can show that the, the practices of misplaced blame, victim blaming, gaslighting, and so on, are deploying um, norms of blame that seem legitimate and familiar to us, it just in ways that are somehow twisted or warped, that that is a way of explaining why they are so pervasive. Uh, what it's part of an explanation about why they're so pervasive. So you're right that on the one hand, it's just so obviously wrong to think like I I get to punish you, you know, because you deceive me. It's just this ridiculous way of thinking. I I totally agree. But my question is, why, why do these other people not see how ridiculous it is? Well, it's because these retributive intuitions are very prevalent within our society, right? And so, but, so that was actually a great question. It's something that I, I need to actually justify, to, uh, explain to motivate my project. Now, the second question was about, um, you know, just these like unbelievably far apart worldviews. But I, I, and I just really have nothing to say about that, except that I think you're exactly right that some people think that they have standing to punish 
people who deviate in various ways from norms that they hold dear because no one else is doing it. The state isn't doing it. They're just teaching critical race theory, right? So I have to do it. I have to do this. And so there's something about being justified in punishing when whoever's supposed to be in charge of maintaining the social order isn't doing it, right? So I, I do think that's going on, but I feel like that's more something for like sociologists um, or political scientists to, 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 to try to explain as a political phenomenon. Yeah, but anyway, great questions. Thank you. We, we do have a Zoom question. Um, Professor Jameson, Ann Jameson. Okay. Hi, sorry, I'm on my phone. Um, so my, my question is, does the term victim, miss, do we have to understand all victims as completely blameless? I'd like to maybe bracket the whole issue of rape because that is such a, that mm -hmm. it seems that it has very specific, um, uh, that's a, that, that seems to me a different kind of conversation than other kinds of conversations. But I'm just wondering if in general, in um, either legal theory or philosophical or the theory that you're um, discussing, if to call someone a victim, they must be blameless or is there a possibility actually of any kind of shared blame in any kind of crime? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. So I don't think it's part of the meaning of the term victim that they're not that they're completely blameless, which leaves open the question of whether, you know, someone who's a victim of a crime or a wrong um, is partially to blame, whether they contributed to their situation. And this is a, an ongoing debate, I think, in um, some of the legal literature about whether, um, so, the, so the case that everybody accepts or seems to accept, because maybe it's baked into the law, are um, crimes of passion, right? So you have, um, people who partially but not fully exculpated um, on the ground that the, the, the person they harmed was just doing something so horrible that their harm is partly excused, they're harming them is partly excused under the law. So, um, I mean, yeah, there's a question of whether you think that those um, laws uh, should make, you know, should be on the books, whether they make sense. Uh, but I don't wanna rule out a priori that that victims never contribute. And I think this is right. I have to go back and, and look at the place where I found this. But when people first started asking questions about what were people doing, looking at what types of people were victimized by what types of crimes, when social theorists were originally doing this, this kind of research, they were, they were trying to figure out how are these victims contributing to their victimization? And it was completely innocent. They just wanted to tell them stuff to do to avoid being victimized. And it was not politically charged, right? It was like, hey, if you keep doing these things, you're more likely to be the victim of crime. So stop doing them, right? But then later, of course, this became so politicized. And the idea, um, you know, women were, you know, legitimately frustrated by, by the idea that, that um, we prevent rape by keeping women in the house instead of getting men to stop raping them. And can I ask a follow-up again, just not, not about rape, um, but say, because it seems to me like, say you are robbing somebody's house, that you are actually robbing their house and they shoot you. Um, could that person who is robbing a house be a victim of a shooting in a state with different laws um, or because they, were, because they were guilty of something could we not properly call them a victim? I mean, I'm just concerned that the term victim blaming kind of assumes that the victim needs to be like somehow pure. And I worry about oh, that. Oh, I see. Bit. Okay, okay. I, okay, so I wasn't really seeing the force of your question. Yes, I know. I think that person could clearly be a victim. Mm -hmm. um, um, but in that case, Anne, I think there... Well, I have to think about it. They were they were they were victimized while they were simultaneously doing something themselves that was wrongful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, but I that would maybe it. be the I forget what exactly what you call it, but the thing where you know that like rape is not a suitable um, 
punishment disproportionate for yes misleading. exactly yeah, plus so the person doesn't have standing yeah the person doesn't mm -hmm. have standing to shoot you well depending on the law i guess in some places what are, what are those laws called you know stand, stand, your, ground. stand your ground yeah like here like like here we have that law. yeah <laughs> so yeah like right like stand your ground laws like when asked like is that really why are we giving standing to punish to the to the to the citizen instead of the state when you're someone's you know violating your property rights yeah i mean i think yeah no i don't want to ever say like the victims have to be pure in order to be victimized Thank you for that, though. Yeah. Did this come up in the Kyle Rittenhouse um, yeah. trial yeah. where the person in Kyle Rittenhouse shot, the judge said you can't call them a victim in the courtroom? Because that. Oh, because they had a gun or they were holding a gun or something? I remember if this. This is a question. Yeah. Um, please, so please restate it. Accused that it was indeed a murder. Yeah. So Jeremy was pointing out that he thought this issue that Anne raised came up in the Kyle Rittenhouse uh, murder trial, where the judge said that the person that Kyle Rittenhouse shot, or he shot more than one, right? One typically, yeah. Uh, <laughs> could not be called a victim. Yeah, that they, could, they couldn't be called a victim on the ground that they had a gun too, or? Or that, or that, that assumes that Kyle Rittenhouse- Oh, that's right, gun. that's right, yeah. That, wow. Okay, right. So that was like prejudging the case by calling the person a victim, yeah, okay. Okay. Oh, Carlos, I'll, I'll just repeat it if you want. I'll just note on this point, since you know, I've been doing with some of our students this research on vigilante murders, that, that in, in earlier versions of common law, it was in fact the presumption in these sorts of cases, like the, the burglar in the house or the house case, that, that everyone involved was guilty of something. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. And, and historians have documented the shift from that to the to the modern sort of logic where oh, there could only be one victim. Okay, and, interesting. And, and of course, race was heavily involved in yeah. the shift from assuming that everyone was guilty to assuming that there could only be one victim. Okay, so were the people on Zoom able to hear that? I'll repeat it. So Carlos was pointing out that historically, um, when some sort of criminal situation arose, the assumption was that everybody involved had done something wrong. So there wasn't this idea that there was this distinct perpetrator that was the wrong, you know, the wrongdoer, and then the victim that was, in Anne's words, pure, right? Uh, not, not in any way morally um, tainted. And he, uh, so, so, I'm gonna have to get citations from you, but he said that um, that that has been an evolution to this idea where you have wrongdoer victim in a really stark sort of separation. That's that's super interesting. Yeah. Beth. Going off of that kind of, I guess my question was more about agency and proving it. And almost cases where they're saying there's no victim, there's just miscommunication. Um, again, stepping away from rape for a minute, I'm thinking of that rich kid who killed a bunch of kids in a car accident and they oh, yeah. affluence her. Yeah, what was yeah, that yeah. about? Yeah. They yeah. said he yeah. didn't yeah. know better. He was brought up, you know, very you know, privileged, yeah. and he just didn't realize that that was yeah. a crime. Yeah. So I guess yeah. I'm wondering, what about cases where they're yeah. just saying, he just didn't know better, yeah. you know? Good. Okay, so I, I love that example, because that fits in with my theory really well, because that is obviously a ridiculous, um, a ridiculous, what am I not I'm laughing at her? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, that is obviously a ridiculous exemption, yeah. right? He doesn't, or, or excuse, sorry, I guess it would be an excuse, or maybe an exemption, one or the other. So, um, yeah, if he didn't know, he should have, so he's culpably, end of story, right? But, um, but it does, there is actually a debate among blame theorists about whether a person can be exempted from blame when they lack what the, um, the theorists call moral competence. So if say they've been raised in such a way that they have all the wrong, like really bad moral values, like they've been raised like by a mafia boss or something, <laughs> right? Or yeah, or like Susan Wolf used this example of someone who was raised by their, their dad was a horrible, vicious dictator, right? So, so this person has all the wrong values, right? And then they do all these horrible things, right? And then the question is, well, are they exempted? Right, because there's a sense in which, like you said, they didn't know. They don't know better. And there's no, it's not obvious that they should have known better. Like you can't say, oh, well, they should have known that, you know, these things are wrong because in their world, that's the value system and they don't see it contradicted. 
So like what the point you're making raises a really deep question about what are, you know, can, what conditions can excuse people, what conditions can exempt people from, from blame? Yeah. Oh, are you gonna come up? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Anne, is that a new hand or your hand still up? Somebody else wanna go So Peggy's okay. coming up, Peggy's coming up. I'm here, yep. <laughs> this lunch was hey, so Peggy. immense, but <laughs> hey, hi, hi, Erica. Hey, thanks for inviting Cindy A to be a fellow and B to perform in this way. This is just great. Uh, so my um, question is about self-blame in these cases. Uh, and is self-blame ever appropriate if the, the um, event is identified as, as rape? So now, here's a way of thinking about this. We told us a story about these two people in the bar. They're sort of cozying up and there's a hand here and there and there's some drinks drunk and, you know. And the way you narrated it is that scene and then he rapes her. Right. So what fill in yeah. can you put in between the scene you described and the event that would make us think about this in different ways? Yeah. Did he drag her out behind the bar and leap on her? Did he, did she say, oh, Riff, let's walk to your apartment? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, tell us about that. Okay. And is self-blame ever appropriate okay. in any of these cases? There's actually a couple different questions I think that you're asking, Peggy. Uh -huh. So let me very quickly say the thing about the drinking. Um, so as it turns out, when people do studies about victim blaming, if the woman is drinking, it increases the blame. Mm -hmm. if the, yeah, she becomes more blameworthy if she's drunk. The man becomes less blameworthy. So it's completely asymmetrical how um, being drunk is treated as either explicating or compounding. So I think that's extremely revealing <laughs> because it just makes him even more incapacitated than he was in the first place, right? And being able to, to control himself. And it makes her more apt to fail to fulfill her obligation, right? Because now she's lost control of herself because she's had so much to drink. So that's, I think, a really important empirical finding. But um, let me say something about self-blame. So there is a literature about this that suggests, um, and I'm by far, I'm far from an expert of, on it, that, uh, that self-blame is psychologically useful for victims because it makes them feel like they have some control over uh, their destiny, that they makes them feel safer because I think, well, if I hadn't have done X, Y, or Z, you know, I, I, I wouldn't have been victimized. Um, but that's not a justificatory thing. That's just a sort of psychological fact about people. And then as far as filling in the scenario, um, I mean, the way you filled it in, she went to his apartment. I mean, that's just another, as far as I see, that's just another, that's a bad judgment case of victim blaming, right? Why did you go to his apartment, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, okay, so let me just say something very, I haven't thought these cases through, the bad judgment cases, because what they really are, are cases where women are blamed because they do something that's considered to be risky for women, right? And they're blamed on that basis. And, the wrong they do is something like carelessness or recklessness or something along those lines. But it's really weird because like, suppose it was like, well, why were you walking alone in the dark at night? Like, what are the odds? Like the risk there is so minimal. Like you're way more apt to like get hurt just driving your car, right? But, but for some reason, even though the risk is minuscule, right? The woman is called out for carelessness or recklessness. Right. So, yeah, that's all I have to say about that particular um, case. I know it can be filled in various ways. And, and, and I'm, I'm just not I'm kind of pushing against the idea that how you filled it in is really going to affect the issue of victim blaming. I think it's more apt to affect other things about the case, like what kind of victim blaming it is. Um, yeah, that. Yeah. Stop there. Did you have a question? Just a quick clarification, Joyce. About the, the empirical findings that you were referring to. You said if the woman is drinking, she's apt to be blamed more. The man is apt to be blamed less. Yes. You mean if the woman is drinking, she's apt to be blamed more. And if the man is drinking, he's apt to be blamed less? Or did you mean if the woman is drinking, 
the woman to more and the men to excuse because the woman was drinking. So did you mean? No. So okay. So you have. Uh, I think it was the first thing. So if a woman is drunk and she's raped, let's not just talk about like how intoxicated the man is, and she's raped, then she's blamed. Well, why were you drinking? Right. Um, if the man is drinking and he rapes someone, again, independent of her intoxication level, it's like, oh my gosh, he totally lost it, you know? And so it's just sort of, he's seen as less blame worthy for rape when he's drinking and she's seen as more blame worthy for rape, for being raped when she's drinking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's really bad. It's really, it's just, it's just amazing. It's just really amazing. Mm -hmm. So, well, I don't think we have questions at this end, Erica. Okay, okay. Um, I was just gonna um, make an observation. I'm really struck by the self-empowering that's attached to self-blaming in this context. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting finding. Um, I know in the workshop, I said you didn't really need to be concerned with legal practical implications, but in jury selection, if we are looking at how people construct what's blameworthy, what's merit worthy and what roles are, are there ways that the insights that you're introducing could be instructive, say like yeah. instructive to juries, instructive to yeah. you may think that in this mm -hmm. instance, this is blameworthy, but in point of fact, these are the kinds of elements you would want to consider. So based on your analysis, your thought experiment, what, what would be helpful and translatable um, yeah. to absolve, frankly, victims? There are notions in tort, I'm sorry that Leslie's gone and I'm not a tort professor, of contributory negligence. I don't think we want yeah. that in yeah. a criminal proceeding. Right. So, um, I guess loaded in my question is I think it would be helpful to actually have the person on trial who's accused of a crime be the person on trial. And yet we know that that is not the case. And there's actually incentive for um, litigants to put the victim on yes, trial. Yes, yes, um, yes. Which blaming yeah. helps. So yeah. you're trying to dismantle that. If you could distill down a takeaway that could be applied for um, the prosecution or a victim's rights advocate, what would we, what would we need to know? Oh, that's a great question. Um, before I answer it, let me just say one quick thing about, about uh, jury selection. I read somewhere that, um, and, and this was quite some time ago, so this may have changed, that um, you, know, you might think the best people to get on a jury uh, in, a, in a rape case are women. And it, it turns out that's not true at all, <laughs> right? Because they are invested in thinking that the woman must have done something to bring the victimization onto herself. They are very invested in thinking that. Um, so they are actually more perhaps apt than others to, to be attracted to a victim blaming narrative. And it turned out that the best people <laughs> The people you want on your jury are older men with daughters. Oh, yeah. That's who you want on your jury because they're more apt to think, oh, this could happen to my daughter. If that jerk had been around my daughter, he might have done it to her, you know? So this, it's, you know, there's so much, I mean, it just shows you how deep the thinking is, like that it goes, it, that, that, that the thought about jury selection is so much already conditioned on who's going to be apt to have sympathy toward the victim or not have sympathy toward the victim in rape cases. I think and we know that some victims get more sympathy than others, right? Like there's- Yeah, and that will depend on race. Statistics and, on yeah. and how near impossible it is for a, woman, a black woman to get a rape conviction. Right, and or sex workers, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah, and so, I mean, it's, I mean, what you're pointing out is just sort of depressing me because it's basically showing that how, how deeply um, entrenched these ideas are. And, and suggesting how hard it is to actually get an impartial jury. Right? But I think you're trying to help us think our way out of that. And I guess I'm, I'm kind of looking yeah. for that. Um, I guess I would want for people to understand how particular norms that, that we want, look, we want exemption norms. Exemption norms are important. It keeps us from blaming people like toddlers and 
people with dementia and and you know all kinds of people who it would just be so harmful and wrong to hold them to standards of, of blame and moral responsibility. So we want exemption norms and we need them and they're important. But then they can get deployed in these ways that are just just wrong and and harmful, right? And I guess for me, and this still at a very abstract level, but I would think that the point would be to show how, you know, look, we're not against saying that people sometimes can't control themselves. We're against saying that this person couldn't control himself in this situation because it's just not, it's just a myth, right? So I'm, I, I don't know how helpful that is. Okay, thanks. Anybody else in the room? Okay, um, nothing else on this room. So thank you, um, everyone. Thank you for coming. Please join us again on April 5th when we will feature Janae um, Grand Russell, who is our visiting scholar from Harvard in Mormon studies, and she will be presenting her work. Um, until then, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much for your support. And thank you, Cynthia Stark, for this wonderful research. Thank you all. <laughs>